Welcome to the podium, a vlog focusing on contemporary issues in education. In this episode, we will focus on special education. We will dissect a book called Somebody Else's Kids by Tori Hayden. Tori Hayden is a child psychologist and special education teacher, as well as a university lecturer. She published this book in 1981, and it has been a staple reader for teachers, parents, and grad students. In this book, Tori walked the readers through one of her academic years as a special education teacher. She talked about her struggles with kids, co-workers, parents, and friends. She talked about the politics behind curriculum and why dictated policy isn't always the best learning model for every student. Several people have posed questions about this book, so I decided to use this podcast to provide answers and elaborate on lessons of this well-written and entertaining book. Goldberg 60408-60408 from Chicago wrote, How did the exceptional learning needs for, Tory, for each of Tory's students impact his or her ability to learn and interact socially? Well, I have to give Tori Hayden credit for her dedication to her students. All of her students had exceptional learning needs. Certainly, these exceptional needs impacted their ability to learn and interact socially. It was up to Tori to figure out how to work with her children's needs to provide them with a quality education. Each of her students posed a unique set of challenges. One of her little guys, Tommaso, was delusional and aggressive. His delusions were about his father. You see, Tommaso's father was killed in front of him during an argument with his girlfriend. Tommaso believed, or at least wanted to believe, that his father was still alive and establishing a life for him elsewhere. One more than, on more than one occasion, Tommaso's delusion or fantasies caused conflict with his peers. One day he brought a ceramic sculpture to school and was, it was hand-painted. Tori noted that the quality of work was not equivalent to that of a grown man, but of a child. Tommaso insisted that his father sculpted the statue and painted it for him as a gift. One of Tommaso's peers called, it, called him on the carpet and pretty much told him that he was lying. Tommaso threw a fit, and when this happened, he, he eventually calmed down enough to talk to Tori, and he had admitted that he had painted the ceramics statue and that his father was dead. I guess it was good that he was able to be honest with about his father's death, but he continued to fantasize about his father, dead father coming to pick him up and start a new life. Tommaso's violent art outbursts caused disruptions for his learning and the learning of his peers. Another young man in Tori's class was a complete puzzle for her. She couldn't figure out how to meet Boo's needs. Boo was susceptible to screaming fits and was unresponsive to his environment. Tori worked hard to break through to this kid and she eventually made progress, but he was not able to thoroughly engage in learning. From time to time, Boo would finally find ways to communicate with people around him. Uh, people had to really be familiar with him in order to understand what he was saying. For example, uh, he revealed that he missed one of his peers by repeating her flashcard drill. Boo's echolalia may seem illogical and out of place, but he made it clear that he was emulating auditory responses to memories which he has. Echolalia is a condition when people repeat things that they've heard. Uh, they may associate auditory events with real-life situations, just as Boo correlated the flashcard drills with his friend Lori. It was difficult for Tori to solicit responses from Boo or to understand when he was responding to things. When he was frustrated, he would take off his clothes and run around the room screaming, sometimes hurting himself. This behavior was distracting to the, to the other kids, and it demanded the teacher's full attention. Boo's inability to effectively communicate did not allow him to engage in lessons or interact with his peers. Another student, Claudia, was a very bright girl. and She had no medical diagnosis for a learning disability. She did have a medical condition, pregnancy. Claudia was removed from her class in a private school because of this. Her parents didn't want her with her peers because they perceived that a 12-year-old pregnant girl was a shameful embarrassment to the family. Claudia was isolated in a special education resource room, 
So she did not have the social interactions which was required for a teenage girl. Although I don't doubt that Tori was an excellent teacher, Claudia's education was different than her peers. Once she had finished her assignments, she was permitted to choose research topics from her, for her own learning. Although she could learn a lot from independent learning, she suffered depression and her social isolation. Finally, Tori's other young lady was sweet Lori. This child had a perfect heart but a damaged brain. Unable to recognize symbols or text, Lori was unable to read. Her inability to read was a major obstacle in her education. Lori's peers ridiculed her for her inability to read. They were too young to understand. In fact, Lori's homeroom teacher probably didn't understand. The homeroom teacher made life and learning difficult for Lori. Uh, she vomited and urinated herself in school one day as a result of her teacher's aggressive approach to Lori's learning. This incident caused Lori to nearly quit school. She in instead missed a portion of her schooling and missed out on social and educational experiences. Tori did the right thing. She went to the girl's house and took her to school even though she was kicking and screaming the entire time. Lori was held back a grade, which was a social nightmare because she would she perceived that she would no longer be twins with her sister, but in the end it worked out. Sarah says, uh, I don't have any children of my own and I'm not familiar with edu uh, special education. Could you describe the characteristics of special needs and how these needs differ from typical child development? Absolutely, Sarah. That's a great question. In regard to Tory students, Boo, uh, his full name is Booth Bernie Franklin, uh, Boo was described as having autism and echolalia. His condition was severe based on the autism cases which I've had the privilege to work with. His behaviors included screaming, escaping the room, tapping his hands. He seemed to be comforted by looking at his fingers as he wiggled them. His expressions were frequently vacant. Uh, Tori called him, called him a body without a soul. Uh, when he first came to her classroom, he was unable to respond or communicate or attend to tasks, but he was able to build up his involvement time by the end of the year. Most children with autism are able to recognize and respond when someone speaks to them, but Boo was unable to do this effectively. Tori had to find a way to communicate with him. I think that she, she did what she did because uh, she was able to pr perform this task uh, and her, the child's mother reported that Boo was able to pick up his room uh, by the year's end. And Tori said that she paired him up with Lori and they worked together on Montessori materials, cooked, cleaned the animal cages, uh, put puzzles together, sorted blocks, and kept the room in order. With her help, Boo was able to attend activities for up to a half an hour. Uh, his needs were primarily communicative and functional skills development. His poor mother just wanted to hear him call her mama. Uh, Lori, Ann Siokheim was her name, uh, she suffered from hyperactivity and brain lesions. Uh, the brain lesions were caused by an abusive home relationship. At one point, Tori mentioned that Lori suffered from seizures and may have had epilepsy. As I mentioned before, Lori cannot identify symbols and letters, so she can't read. She could not copy sentences and she had difficulty concentrating. She was easily distracted and she found it hard to sit still. She knew her alphabet orally but couldn't recognize written words. Lori wanted her to be in regular education but she didn't have the skill set. When she, she literally worried herself sick, like I talked about, when her academic deficiency, with her academic deficiencies in front of her peers. Her teacher gave her difficult reading to perform in front of class, which made Lori vomit on herself. And Lori needed special instruction in reading and possibly some emotional counseling. Brave Tommaso. He carried a wagon train of emotional baggage. 
He displayed severe anger, foul language, and racist comments. He performed these negative behaviors to get specific types of reactions from people. Tori mostly ignored Tom's negative behaviors. She said that inattention seemed the soundest recourse. Tom experienced extreme trauma and deliberately acted out in an effort to keep people at a distance. He had moved from foster home to foster home. He was sold as a slave, bounced to and from relatives, taken into protective custody, and more. Tom's learning needs included trust. He needed to learn to trust people and build relationships. Being sold to people in Michigan by your uncle is not typical for any child. Tom once held a scissor to Tori's stomach with her back against the wall. I respect that teacher so much. Although she was terrified, she maintained her composure and embraced him afterwards. Tori did a nice job of working with Tommaso on his social and emotional development. Claudia, as I stated earlier, did not enter Tori's room with a specific learning disability. That's not to say she didn't have special learning needs. Tori knew precisely what Claudia needed, but it was not available to her at the time. Tori looked long and hard for a support group for unwed preteen mothers. Claudia was a very smart girl, but she needed emotional support. I thought that it was interesting that Tori and Claudia talked about sex. I'm sure that it's no, it isn't normal for young students to ask female teachers about intercourse, and I don't mean to pass judgment. I think under those circumstances, Tori did the right thing. She had a student who was emotionally struggling you know, with what was happening to her. Sadly, Claudia made an attempt on her own life. When it when it was brought to her uh, as an adult to comment on her childhood experience, Claudia, the adult, uh, she she's now a child psychologist. She declined to comment. Uh, no doubt that this chapter in her life is sad, and having to reveal it to the world is probably humiliating. Most children Claudia's age do not attempt suicide, suicide, nor are they pregnant. Our next question is from Mr. Jones. Uh, Mr. Jones writes, I'm a first year special education resident teacher. Can you share a couple of interventions Tori implemented to address social or uh, special learning needs? Thanks for your question, Tim. Good luck with your residency experience. Tori's school had reading series programs where only 15% of the students were expected to be able to be fully engaged. These programs wouldn't work with the 50 percentile, not to mention struggling learners. Tori had to devise her own interventions, and she had to be creative about it. When she was audited by Dr. Boom, she was asked to, to define her instructional model. Tori couldn't answer the question. She was faced with difficult cases and children that didn't necessarily know that they, that they wanted or needed help. Uh, Boo, he had several needs, but I think that Tori focused on his developing communication and functional skills. Tori tried to talk with Boo, but that didn't solicit a reaction. Most of the time, Boo didn't even acknowledge that anyone else was in the room. Tori held Boo and he became upset. But as a male teacher, I've been uncomfortable with the idea of holding a student because of false accusations, though I do recognize the need for emotional nurturing for little tykes. Another method that Tori used with Boo was pairing. Now, she paired him up with peers whenever possible. She attributed his development to the time he spent with Lori and Claudia. Tori said that Boo was mildly toilet trained by the end of the school year and was able to attend activities longer because he was paired with other students. I think that Tori mostly spoke about the interventions which she had with Lori. Lori appeared to be a typical learner, but she could not read. Her homeroom teacher, teacher Edna Thorson, used the previously mentioned reading series books even though she hated them. I might even say that Edna hated to have Lori in her class. Edna called Lori 
slowly and said that teachers couldn't get letters through her head with a gun. Uh, Tori used a multitude of strategies to try and teach Lori how to read. She first began with the alphabet. To do this, Tori cut letter shapes out of sandpaper and made Lori feel them to recognize the shapes. She also made Lori trace letters in the sand. She used flashcards in a game, kind of like Old Maid, and Lori was given more pullout time. Lori couldn't read a clock or tell time, so Tori tried a braille clock. Lori could do math, but she had to do it with manipulatives or orally. The list could just go on. Uh, Lori tried very hard and may have been the most difficult case for Tori that, uh, that she had as a teacher that year. This teacher tried every method that she could think of to try and teach Lori how to read. Tori seemed completely stumped by Tommaso. At first, she let him stay distant and warm up on his own. Boo usually float around in, uh, floated around the room and in a world of his own, but Tommaso, or, or Tom, he, he was aware of the other people that were in the room, and he watched them. Tori said that he would occasionally join the group uh, by talking to the other students or sitting near them when they worked. His social rejection uh, from being bounced from foster family to foster family had left him deeply scarred. So Tori gave him time to adjust in her class. She decided to just wait him out on the work issues, she said. Uh, for his violent outbursts, she had to physically restrain him. The little guy would just go off and destroy things or hurt people. People in the media like to blast special education for when we have to do restraints, but sometimes it is to protect not only ourselves but the other students. Sometimes we have to restrain students from hurting themselves. It is a sad part of our job, but it, it is necessary. Whenever I have to do restraints, I always think about the student's future. We do it because the student does not have the ability to restrain himself. It's our job to teach him to restrain himself so he doesn't hurt other people in the world after he leaves our school. The best thing that Tori did for Tom, though, was to pair him up with Lori as her official reader. She said that this intervention caused him to be calmer and more even-tempered. She also reported that although he was still behind the development of his peers, he advanced his reading by 18 months over the course of the year. That's significant. I'm not sure Tori really knew what to do for Claudia. She did seem thankful that she didn't have to make any lessons for Claudia since they all came from the private school. And Claudia was basically in social isolation in Tori's room. Uh, Tori recognized that uh, Claudia needed therapy that she was not trained to administer. So she called around to find the proper student support. Uh, she called Planned Parenthood, the local hospital, uh, mental health specialist, the high school guidance department, a priest, the guidance department again, uh, the high school uh, school nurse, uh, nobody was able to help. They all said the same basic thing. She's too young for a teen pregnancy help group. This blows my mind. Why would anybody turn away somebody when they're in clear need of help? I don't understand how these adults couldn't recognize that this young lady was in a desperate situation. Claudia tried to kill herself. If she had succeeded, everyone who was indifferent to helping this child would have been the cause. I know that may seem harsh on my part, but Claudia was a kid. Besides searching for a help group for Claudia, Tori also tried to build up her confidence by assigning her classroom duties and customizing her curriculum. Uh, she became an effective classroom helper. She helped potty train Boo. Tori said that he was dry for three quarters of the time at the end of the year as opposed to zero percent of the time at the beginning of the year. Uh, Claudia was a good student who had worked hard on her assignments when she had completed her curriculum. 
she was able to uh, select her own research topics. These activities allowed Claudia to not only build her confidence, but also her independence. Thanks for the question. Uh, well, our next question is from Whizbang704. He writes, could you explain the cultural and linguistic communication differences amongst Tori's students while addressing the strategies Tori used to address these differences? Certainly, Whizbang. Tori's group was eclectic in many ways. To say that her kids varied merely in culture and communication is an understatement. I think that today's society is a buzz with things like culture. For people who grew up in ethnic, ethnically diverse areas, race and culture are largely unimportant yet celebrated. During my student teaching experience through NDSU, I had a few students who were not white. One of those students had a great sense of humor, and he made a joke about his skin color. It was a true celebration of his uniqueness compared to his peers. The whole class erupted in laughter. Everybody embraced the diversity. All of the student teachers met on the university campus every other week to check in. And the professor always asked if anybody had something to share. So I wanted to share this story. As soon as I mentioned that I had a black student, uh, the professor interrupted me and asked me why it was relevant that I mentioned that he was black. Now, her oversensitivity to culture created an uncomfortable learning environment for the college students, and it had colored me as a racist. If you've ever seen that one episode of The Office called Diversity Day, it's, uh, it's like season one, episode two, or something like that, you might remember the corporate liaison saying something about not being colorblind. I really liked what he said. Diversity is too frequently shoved under the rug or viewed in a negative light. Uh, diversity should be celebrated always. In our uniqueness lies our beauty. Tori's kids, like I said, were unique. Sometimes the kids touched on the culture question. Tommaso was a student who brought it up the most. Uh, he, he was proud to be Spanish, but uh, he regularly, regularly dropped racial slurs against the white and black people in his class. I think that he kind of had a crush on Lori because he was usually nice to her and he kept telling her that she looked Spanish. Tori probably took this into account when she paired the two of them together. Lori needed to work on her reading and Tom needed to work on his relationships. Tom became officials or Lori's official reader and they built a mutually beneficial relationship. Yet, uh, whenever Tom was racially insensitive against other students, Tori would intervene. I noticed, however, that she didn't always respond when he called her racially charged names. She must have been ignoring it so she wouldn't feed his behavior with attention? I'm just guessing. Tom used a lot of Spanish language in class, more so when he was emotional. Um, but talking about Boo, Boo had parents who came from varied cultural backgrounds. Uh, Boo's mother was black and his father was white. I don't remember if Boo's family practiced any particular faith, but they chose to place him in a religious school, which did not share their beliefs, apparently. Uh, they didn't care, though. They said that it would be an improvement if Boo showed that he believed in anybody's religion. Uh, the ethnic diversity of Tori's class caused tensions between her and some of the parents. For example, uh, Claudia's parents, her father, came to visit Tori, and he said the, to Tori, he said, well, you know, my, my daughter comes home and says that she works closely with a, a black kid. And Tori said, well, is, did, did Claudia say that that was a problem? And the father said, well, she didn't. And uh, Tori interpreted that as he did. Uh, Claudia's father also made a comment about Tom not being white. Again, Tori picked up that this guy didn't highly regard, regard cultural diversity. Tor, Tori just bit her tongue. She treated each child equally, regardless of race, color, or creed. 
Our next question comes from Mira from Albuquerque. Hello, Mira. She says, I'm the parent of a special education student. How did the exceptional learning needs of Tory students impact their families? Good question. Exceptional learning needs are commonly dealt with differently at home than at school. I once worked with a severe case where a student threatened to kill me every day. He tried a few times, but he was never successful. I spoke with the foster father daily and discovered that he and his wife were also targeted by threats. We used CPI at school for students who try to hurt other people. We had the manpower to hold this child, which sometimes took eight people at a time. We took shifts if the student fought for long periods of time. I'm talking hours. Uh, the foster father had to try and do it by himself. The child was eventually sent to the state home in Grafton, North Dakota, where his foster father, or because his foster father walked in on a student trying to kill his foster mom. Uh, Tory students, though, uh, their exceptional needs also impacted their home lives. Claudia's family was ashamed because she was pregnant. They, they went out of their way to isolate her from her peers. I spoke with a co-worker this morning and she told me that her mother was pregnant as a teenager and her parents did exactly what Claudia's parents did. They avoided social situations right until the end of her pregnancy. Tommaso's life was the most terrible part of the story. Again, he had witnessed his step, uh, his, his uh, father get murdered by his his father's girlfriend during an argument. Uh, from that point on, the kid was placed in several foster homes until his uncle claimed him. Uh, he was removed from the uncle's custody because of the abuse-related issues and the fact that the kid was seven years old and had never been sent to school. His foster care resumed, uh, but the uncle was again able to secure custody. The jerk sold the kid into slavery for $500 in Michigan. The uncle was arrested and Tom was placed in a series of foster homes. The kid had attachment issues like I've never seen before. He was mean to everyone because he didn't want to be hurt anymore. He didn't want to have to establish new relationships and then fall, you know, love these people and then have to deal with the loss. And I'm sure you could understand. He was probably a holy terror for his foster placements based on his uh, performance at school. I couldn't imagine what it was like for Boo's parents. They couldn't communicate with their son. His mother's big issue was that she wanted him to call her mama. That is so sad. He was eventually able to communicate on a limited scale and he was able to follow simple directions but his mother said that, he, you know, he, he couldn't communicate effectively. You know, and she was happy that he was able to do certain, certain things like pick up his room at home when she asked him to. Tori said that he was able to follow directions on certain tasks because she paired him up again with Lori and Claudia. The girls taught him how to engage in topics for longer periods of time and to perform activities. Sadly, Boo's family never was able to communicate with him on a deep level. Lori's family was very supportive of her schooling, but their lives were intertwined with her edu education. Lori was very close with her twin sister, who would come to Tori's room for work. The adoptive father was a single parent who worked hard to provide for the family, even though he didn't fully understand Lori's condition. Lori was terribly depressed because of an incident in school. She refused to leave the house to go to school. That had to have put a lot of pressure on the family. Uh, it's, it's an, it, it is understandable that Lori would have experienced emotional turmoil. Lori's family suffered emotionally along with her. Uh, we have no, another question from Mr. Jones. Uh, Mr. Jones says, how has the federal definition of emotional disturbance changed since Tory was 
a practicing special education teacher in this book. Also, what were the issues relative to the area of emotional disturbance from then and now, such as least restrictive environment or over-representation? Mr. Jones, thank you for your questions. When Tory was a special education teacher, uh, the government implicated Public Law 94-142, uh, also called the Mainstreaming Act. This law was designed to place students with special needs into the least, least restrictive environment. It was intended to normalize special education students by maintaining mainstreaming them and supplementing their instruction with help in a resource room. When that law was implemented, many self-contained rooms were closed. Tory Hay in Tory Hayden's district alone, something over 50 children were transferred from self-contained rooms to mainstream classrooms. Only one of the special education classrooms was maintained, and that was for students who were severely mentally handicapped. The students who remained behind were unable to communicate. Uh, they were unable to care for their own hygiene or function independently. Of all of the students with special special needs, uh, most of them were sent off to learn with their peers. The laws of the time removed the legitimacy of the special education uh, room uh, as a classroom. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, defines emotional disturbance as a condition exhibiting uh, specific characteristics over a long period of time and to a marked degree that adversely affects a child's educational performance. There is a list of qualifiers for services which are, if you'll indulge me, uh, an inability to learn that cannot be explained by intellectual, sensory, or health factors. An inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships with peers or teachers. An inappropriate, inappropriate types of behavior or feelings under normal circumstances. A general pervasive mood of unhappiness or depression. And finally, a tendency to develop physical symptoms of fear associated with personal or school problems. I took that information directly from the website for the National Dissemination Center for Children with Disabilities. According to their website, the group's federal funding has been terminated <coughs> and the organization no longer exists. However, their web host was prepaid and will maintain uh, the site until next September. So if you're interested in that information, you can look it up. It's the National Dissemination Center for Children with Disabilities. Anyway, moving on. Our, our laws today in the United States require that we educate our students in the least restrictive environment. We often educate our stu students with disabilities in mainstream classes. If students require supplemental instruction, we provide it in the resource rooms, or we have paras or special education staff uh, go into the students' uh, classes. In Fargo, I know that there are a few self-contained uh, ID classrooms. I had the opportunity to work in one at the high school level. I also had the opportunity to work at one at an elementary school in, in Moorhead. It, it's called uh, Alan Hopkins. Uh, uh, in both circumstances, the primary, uh, uh, the primarily self-contained students participated with their peers. Uh, my elementary students were able, unable to participate in music class in the same capacity as the rest of the students because they were not verbal and they did not understand the premise of the flutophone recorder. Uh, one of my students placed the recorder up to her mouth and held it there till drool was running out the bottom. She just didn't understand what to do. My kids also went to, with their peers to gym. And again, they were, they were really unable to fully engage the lesson. My, my point is 
that inclusion in mainstream is a good idea, but it isn't always the best option. My high school students participated in an adaptive PE class if they weren't able to fully participate in regular PE. However, it was encouraged that students from the self-contained room participate in as many mainstream content areas as possible. Anyhow, under the contemporary definition of emotional disturbance, Lori, Tommaso, and Boo would definitely qualify, but I'm not sure that Claudia would. She was pregnant. Pregnancy is not an illness or cognitively debilitating condition. We can implement a 504 plan, which is a temporary adaptation plan, to modify curriculum in PE or other classes which might be difficult for a pregnant person to perform. Uh, Tori even told us that Claudia was able to complete all of her coursework and then some. Okay, our next question again from Mr. Jones. Uh, he says, how did Tori demonstrate respect for each of her students and their families as unique human beings with different values, beliefs, languages, if applicable, and customs. Mr. Jones, thank you for your thoughtful questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, Tori was definitely more empathetic with her students when compared to her co-workers. Edna showed no mercy to students who she considered to be intentionally underachieving. This frustrated Tori, whose metacognition revealed that she kept her teacher-student relationship grounded in reality. She said that, uh, and I quote, I had no children of my own. Because of that, I knew that I did not fully understand the life of a parent, regardless of how much I wished I did. Having four children, six hours a day, works out mathematically to the same as having one for 24 hours a day, but mathematics and emotions do not spring from the same well. Very well said. Tori treated her students and their family as if they were her own. She advocated for her kids. She tried to teach the parents how to advocate for their kids. She tried to teach the kids how to advocate for themselves. Additionally, Tori thought, the saddest part about being human is the depth of our ignorance. Intellectually, I could accept that for many of the questions there, were nev there would never be answers. Emotionally, I do not think I ever did. As far as Tori's respect for others, values, beliefs, language, and whatnot, she kept her personal beliefs out of her work. Although she never revealed her religious disposition, in somebody else's kids? A little research on my behalf discovered that Tori supports an emotional distress help group named Samaritans. The organization was founded by a priest in the London Diocese and was named after a famous story in the New Testament. This hints that Tori Hayden might be a Christian, but it is only a hint. Uh, John 13, 35 says that by, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Tori truly showed love for everyone. I think I mentioned this earlier, but Boo's parents sent him to a parochial school after the time, uh, per after the time period that was contained in this book. But Tori cautioned the parents about the conflict of religion between the school and the family's home. Language? Language was respected in Tori's room when used appropriately. She noted that Tommaso was bilingual. He spoke Spanish, especially when his emotions were high. Tori never reprimanded him for speaking Spanish. It was just part of who he was. I learned that some Spanish-speaking cultures in America use both lexicons in tandem. Most of the staff at Logandale Middle School, where I worked, spoke Spanish. They would chat away in the office and I would catch words here and there that I thought were English. I inquired about it one day. The secretary told me that some words in English or Spanish do not have direct translations. So when you're speaking, you, you know, might 
uh, transition between the languages in an effort to use the to use the most precise words as possible. Uh, this made perfect sense to me. This is precisely what Tom had done. It, it was part of his culture. Tori did nothing to stifle that, and I respect her for it. Okay, we have one more question here from uh, Dr. Marcy Glessner from the University of North Dakota. She wrote, what was Tori's teaching philosophy uh, compare and contrast her philosophy with yours. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Tori wasn't able to answer this question, but I'll do my best to explain my views. I think that Tori wasn't able to answer this question because she didn't prescribe to just one philosophy. I think that Tori used different philosophies for different students. For example, she used a humanistic approach for Claudia. Claudia needed self-fulfillment and free choices in her educational activities. That's exactly what Tori gave her. Tori gave Claudia the opportunity to conduct independent research. Considering what Claudia might have, considering, you know, Claudia, Claudia might have wanted to research pregnancy or something related to her circumstance, she had the chance. I believe that she was using the cognitive approach for Lori because her knowledge of written language distorted and was distorted and deficient. Uh, Tori used direct teaching with Lori. With Tommaso, she used a psychoeducational approach, which focused on his emotions and behaviors. She sought to understand and to help Tom deal with the unconscious motivations behind his actions. She did her best to help Tom cope with his anger and help him with his psychological barriers to building relationships. I would venture to say that Boo benefits from the social learning approach. He learns best by observing others. Uh, Boo was able to perform tasks after he had done them with Lori and Claudia. Whether Tori did this intentionally or not, I don't know, but it did work. My philosophy is similar to Tori's. I believe that each student might require different, different philosophical approaches. Sadly, the amount of time that we can commit to program and develop for each child uh, is very limited. People think that teachers work 8.30 to 3 o'clock and have summers off. Au contraire, teachers get to work in an hour or so early before the kids get there so they can set up for the day's lessons. Then they stay several hours after the kids leave so they can grade papers, return emails, you know, reorganize their rooms, and do whatever else they need to do. In addition to this, teachers have to find room to conduct prog progress monitoring, attend meetings, complete professional development, go to district training exercises, call parents, tutor kids, coach, apply for grants, fill out government mandated paperwork to secure school funding. Uh, did I mention that on top of all of this, teachers are supposed to have enough time to brainstorm and develop meaningful, appropriate activities tailored to the needs of every child? My philosophy is that we as teachers should do our best to provide a free and appropriate education for every student as mandated by law. Uh, the problem is that teachers have too much to do to be able to do their job to their own satisfaction. Much of this is the fault of politicians who want to sound empathetic and blame educational institutions for the lack of parenting in the United States. Those politicians create more work for teachers and take the teacher's attention away from students. Anyhow, those are all of the questions which I have time to answer today. Thank you for everyone for your comments. Except for Black Sabbath 75, you need serious help. For the rest of you, thanks again and be sure to check out uh, Tori Hayden's other great books. If you have any other uh, questions, please post them. If you have any ideas for our show, please feel free to comment below. Thanks. See you next time.